Hello. I'd like to welcome everybody to Growing Software Developers Through Apprenticeship. Uh, my name's Chris Nelson. And uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I'm one of the co-founders here at Gaslight. And I'm also um, kind of the creators of our Dev Builders Apprenticeship Program. And that's what I'm going to be talking about here today. Um, so the agenda for today, um, first of all, I'm just kind of going to start with giving an overview of the program and how it works. Um, so this is a recording of an event, and you're going to hear apprentices sharing their experience directly, and that's kind of most of the session. Uh, I'm going to start with an overview of it. Uh, you'll notice that uh, I'm wearing uh, different clothes and, and slightly different than the rest of the presentation. We had an issue recording the live session, so this part of it is me kind of going over the material, uh, fixing it in post, if you will. Uh, so I'm going to start with an overview of it, and then we'll move on to the uh, panel of apprentices sharing their experience directly, and we'll have some audience participation from the event that we had. So, um, always good to start all your presentations with a quote, and uh, this, of course, is um, from the uh, seminal IT recruiting tome, Pride and Prejudice. Of course, that's a fake quote. But I think it illustrates a really real point, which is that um, I've been a software developer for 20 years or so, and um, really the whole time, the demand for software developers uh, has been really, really strong. Uh, it's just a field um, that those of us who are in it are really fortunate to be in a position where um, you know, the demand for our services is really good. And, uh, and that's a great thing, and, and that's one of the reasons why bringing more people into the field of software development is so important and, and so useful. So I'm going to start with kind of a history of uh, our Dev Builders Apprenticeship Program and how, how it came about and, and then dive into how it works more. Uh, so we founded Gaslight, which is a company that does web and mobile app development for customers. Um, we have teams of developers that work together to ship stuff. Um, and we came together as a collection of pretty experienced developers that kind of joined forces. That's kind of how Gaslight was born. And we started it in 2009. Uh, so this was kind of like right in the middle of one of the worst economic downturns we've ever had, certainly in my lifetime. And um, the effect on software developers was really pretty minimal. And, um, and at the time, Gaslight was forming uh, a lot of us knew personally, almost everybody knew personally somebody who was affected, who was out of work or laid off um, or trying to find enough work. And it just really made us think, like, how do we make our field, which we enjoy and love and feel fortunate to be in, how do we make it more accessible to more people? And a lot of people, not just us, were thinking about this idea at about the same time. And um, it led to some early efforts. One of the earliest that I uh, remember hearing about was uh, a company called Living Social that had a program called Hungry Academy. And their program, um, the way I, I heard about it, was uh, it started in large part by Chad Fowler, their CTO, and a couple other people, Jeff Casimir, who now runs Turing Academy. Uh, and they had this idea that they could take people kind of off the street, brand new to software development, and over six months help them become real developers. And uh, it was a paid program. And uh, they took um, from a pool of hundreds of applicants, uh, they winnowed it down to you know, the, the, the best they could find out of that pool, of course, and took 24 people. And over the course of six months, um, taught them to become developers. And um, the way I heard it, um, their success metric was going to be if they were able to take half of the people into that program and um, graduate them into developers. That would be a successful experience for them. And they were able to take all 24 and hire them. Um, so that was a pretty awesome program. And the word got out about this, and it kind of led to the realization that, hey, um, you can, over the course of months, help people become developers. And this was, uh, in a lot of ways, kind of the beginning of the boot camp movement that happened about this same time. And uh, you know, programs started up to, over the course of, few, of a few really intense months, 
intense months uh, help people become developers. And um, I myself got a chance to teach at a program called Dev Boot Camp um, in uh, the summer of 2014. And I saw firsthand um, what, the, what programs like this were like. And I also got to see students go through and graduate from this program. And uh, I was really impressed with my experience at Dev Boot Camp, um, just the, um, the level of, of people changing their lives was really exciting. Uh, and I got to see two classes of students graduate and see their final projects. And I was really impressed with uh, the, the apps that they were building in their final projects. Um, as an experienced developer, um, I was really impressed with what they were building and the fact that I myself, to build that same app, would really have to, to learn some things and think about how to do it. it they were building non-trivial apps, and uh, it was clear that they were actually producing um, people who could really ship, ship real software. Um, so uh, that was really, really impressive, um, and I also knew at the same time the demand for software developers was really, really high. Um, and when I saw the students graduate, what surprised me was they were not immediately hired. Uh, over the course of six months, they did a job search and, and they, they measured success of Dev Boot Camp over six months. And they had a very good track record of like 90% over that time period. But what I realized by actually seeing these students in person experience, uh, six months is a long time and they struggled more than I thought made any sense to get that first position. And so it made me think like, why, where, why is there a problem where we have um, people who have become developers and, and built some skills, why are they having uh, trouble getting hired? And uh, I realized that there was basically a discrepancy between what companies were looking for and where these developers are at. And, and something like this was too, right? Um, you know, how do you get your first developer job? Uh, well, just already have two to three years of experience, right? Um, you know, what I realized was that companies has an idea in their mind typically of a developer with kind of that two to three years experience level uh, where they would be self-sufficient, they could hand them a project and say go, and people coming out of these programs could build apps, had development skills, but did not have the experience of working professionally as part of a team. So this kind of was the beginning of the plan. Um, I saw that there was a pool of talent coming into the field. There was clearly a demand for them, there, but there was this gap between uh, companies that wanted to hire developers and developers coming into the field. And basically the Dev Builders Apprenticeship Program is all about meeting that gap. And basically here's how it works. Uh, it's a six month paid apprenticeship program. Uh, we form a team with an experienced developer mentor, somebody who can write code, contribute to projects, uh, ship code to production, all that good stuff. Uh, I initially served in that role and we take that developer mentor and we form a team where we have pairs of apprentices with the mentor. And that team then joins a real client that's identified that needs to grow their development talent. Uh, so they have clearly identified jobs that they're trying to fill. And that apprentice mentor team actually has a real project to work on for that client. So they're doing real stuff, shipping valuable software to production over six months. And, uh, and then uh, the, the apprentices are leveling up their skills at the same time they're getting stuff done and shipping code to production. Uh, the client has a chance to see these apprentices grow into valuable team members. And then at the end of the six month program, uh, the apprentices have grown into capable, experienced developers. Uh, it's a no-brainer for the client to hire them and have them to continue to work uh, doing, you know, shipping the same kind of valuable software to production for them. Uh, the apprentices graduate into full-time developers for that client, and the mentor then starts over with another team. Uh, 
So it's something that we've seen now work for the past year and a half, and we're super excited about it. And um, yeah, the results are, are becoming evident. We started it um, a year and a half ago in March 2016 with our first partner. Uh, since then, based on client demand, we've grown from just a single mentor, which was me, and I now have two other mentors helping me out. Uh, I currently have six apprentices going right now. Um, over the course of the, the program, since March of last year, we've had six apprentices go through the program, and I'm super excited to report that all of them are working in the field as software developers. Um, so it, it's been really exciting to see what, the, what was an idea, you know, kind of an experiment in some ways, uh, how it turned out and, uh, and how, how people have, um, you know, joined the field of software development. And uh, we're gonna get a chance to talk to uh, a few of them firsthand and, and share their, ex and learn from their experience. Um, so it's been super rewarding for me personally. Um, seeing people change their lives is, is really an incredible thing. And as an experienced developer, um, you know, it's really brought me a lot of joy. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the selection process for apprentices. And this is something that I feel like I've learned a lot about as the program has, has gone along. How do we, um, you know, kind of identify apprentices that are gonna have the best chance at, at being successful? And the process goes like this. Uh, we start with an initial interview, um, and that's um, relatively informal, half an hour-ish, where I just kind of get to know the apprentice, find out what got them interested in software development, uh, what they've been doing so far, and, and get a feel for where they might be at as far as skills and what they've learned so far. Um, I also have them take a math and logic test. It's about 40 minutes timed. Um, you know, mostly story problems that don't go beyond the level of about Algebra 1. And it's not so much because those math skills are um, going to be used necessarily a ton day to day as a software developer. Um, but what I've learned, and I actually borrowed this math logic test from another bootcamp program. Um, and, and really, my, it's based on their learning. And what they did is they used this test to um, to filter out and, and decide which candidates were gonna be a good fit for their program. And they had the students take this test at the beginning, and then at the end of their program, they assessed the students. And what they saw is a really pretty strong correlation between the, the students that took the test and scored high also tended to do well at the end of the program and have high assessment scores. So. Um, I started adding it, um, and I have the, the, all the uh, apprentice candidates take this test. It comes, it gives me a data point for really how like how quickly they are going to pick up abstract concepts. Because um, what I've learned is more than anything else, um, how quickly an apprentice learns and grows is way more important than uh, what they know coming in on day one, and then. Uh, one of the other Im important things, and probably the most as important assessment uh, thing that we do, um, I get together in person or remotely with the apprentice and actually um, have them show me an app that they've built already and live code adding a feature to that app. So it's kind of pair programming. Um, I'm seeing them write code in person it's not so much uh, whether they get that feature completed or not, but it really gives me a chance to observe how they think about code, how they problem solve, how they debug. Uh, it becomes really clear, do they understand all the code that they've written or have they just kind of seen a few tutorials and, and, and still struggling a bit? It really gives me a pretty good feeling for where they're at and how they're gonna do. So uh, I mentioned already, um, one of the key learnings that I've had in, in this whole thing is that, um, you know, the, the way somebody puts it is, is higher for slope, not y-intercept. And that's kind of a mathy way to express it. And uh, 
Hopefully this made up graph here kind of illustrates my point. If you have two apprentices there, red and blue, and uh, one of them can start with a higher initial set of knowledge there, but if they don't grow as fast, it really doesn't matter because somebody starting with maybe less knowledge that learns and applies concepts more quickly, over the course of six months, they're gonna have plenty of time to be successful. And so that kind of led me to a key realization that rather than trying to find apprentices with knowledge of specific languages and frameworks and things like that to match up with the client, it was way more important to figure out which apprentices were going to be likely to learn and grow the fastest. And that's really more about um, their aptitude and enthusiasm more than anything else. So um, specifically what an apprenticeship looks like as far as like day-to-day, week-to-week activities. Um, the core activity that an apprentice does is around the idea of pair programming. Pair programming is something that we have done at Gaslight for years. We've seen it be the best way that we know to, to write software. And with an apprentice, it works really, really well as a way for them to learn. And pair programming is basically two developers sitting together at the same computer and uh, kind of taking turns writing code, talking about code, sharing ideas. It's basically two minds working together. And um, in the context of apprenticeship, um, uh, an apprentice will come in and be paired with another experienced developer. That might be their mentor. It might be uh, another experienced dev on the team. And initially, pairing to them is going to look like um, them watching, asking questions, learning, and you know, figuring out what's going on. Uh, but what we find is just even over the course of a few weeks, um, the apprentice starts to see more and more and understand more and more of what's going on. They start to get a chance to get at the keyboard and, and write code the next time they've seen something similar happen. And what we look for is that pair programming that we do over the course of six months. Uh, what we look for is the time the apprentice is at the keyboard uh, becomes more and more balanced over time. So the first time uh, the apprentice sees something brand new, you know, um, they're maybe not going to be at the keyboard very much, but the next time they see something similar, they get a chance to drive more. Uh, the next time, a little bit more, and it just kind of kind of happens fairly naturally that um, over the course of six months, if things are going well, uh, pairing with an apprentice becomes more and more of an evenly balanced thing, and that's, that's how they become developers, essentially. Um, we do a few other things during the apprenticeship. Uh, we have a book club that all the apprentices are participating in uh, where we're going through technical books. We're going through books about how to learn to become a developer. <clears throat> we're going through books about code. Uh, what does go good code look like? What do we value about writing code together in a team environment? Um, <clears throat> we're doing assessments with the apprentice kind of every week, kind of check-ins to see how it's going and then more formal assessments every couple months uh, to kind of get the feedback from the team as far as is the apprentice on track to get hired at the end of the program as a developer. So um, where do I find apprentices? And I've been super fortunate so far in that, um, you know, for reasons that I'm not entirely sure I understand, they're just aren't enough opportunities for people that are coming into the field of development to get their first shot. So um, the word's kind of gotten out and uh, more and more apprentice candidates are kind of finding me and reaching out to me. Uh, we have just a page on our website that lays out the selection process and how to jump in. And typically the route for most of the apprentices that I'm working with uh, are through either boot camps, which I talked about uh, with my experience at Dev Builder Chicago, but I'm also seeing a lot of developers that are self-taught, which I think is super interesting. And I've always known this was a, you know, the way that a lot of people come into the field of development, but more and more, there's so much information out there online. Uh, there's great um, you know, programs like Udemy, 
and Harvard CS50 and Free Code Camp, just to name a few. There are great online resources for learning programming. There are just so many. Uh, and people are leveraging these uh, free or, or paid resources to learn to become developers, getting to the level of being able to build uh, basic web apps and then getting into the program. And I've seen a number of them, you know, a good number of them become successful developers that way. So um, certainly going to a boot camp, going to an intensive program is uh, a way that works for a lot of people. But what's been interesting is it's definitely not the only way. And, um, you know, you can do this just through going at it using online means. And uh, the cool thing is now there's a pool of people that have done it before and you can learn from them and talk to them too. Um, so that's been really exciting to see that there's multiple avenues that people are getting to the level of being an apprentice. So um, that's kind of my spiel about the program itself. Uh, what I'd like to do now is actually introduce the apprentices we have here and uh, get to know them and have them share their experience firsthand about what it's like to be an apprentice. Thanks. So I thought I'd start with just introducing everybody and, uh, and I'll let them talk about what they've been doing so far. But this is Omar, this is Anna, this is Miles, and oh, I should have differentiated the names. Anna Canellas, Miles Beer, Anna Humphreys, <laughs> Sasha Rucka. Did I pronounce your name well enough? Well, well enough. <laughs> The other Zach. I have more than one Zach. Right? And that's the one you work with. <laughs> yes, I should, I should get this right. So I'll start with having you describe um, what project you're on right now and what, what phase of things you're in. All right. So um, I've been an apprentice for three months now, so I'm halfway through the program. Uh, I'm working at a company called Plexus uh, up in Montgomery. And uh, so what they do is they manage uh, like loyalty programs for uh, franchisees. So mainly Subway is our big one. We manage their loyalty program. Uh, and right now uh, I'm working on, well, I will start working on uh, an app that kind of manages their like gift cards and all of that. So that's what I'm doing. I'm Sasha. I'm a software developer at, well, I'm an apprentice, but I'm working at Kroger. Um, I'm at the end of my six-month apprenticeship. I just found out that me and the other apprentice are going to be hired on, so that's great. Um, <laughs> uh, we're working on the ClickList application, which is um, if you go to Kroger.com, you can buy your groceries online, pick them up at the store. So yeah. My name is Anna, and I'm a graduated apprentice that also works at Kroger Digital, and I'm part of the store locator team, so Kroger.com slash store slash search, where you'd figure out where your nearest grocery store is, filter, buy things you need to go to for the store, too, and uh, we also pick up a lot of random things, so I work at Kroger. Hi, uh, my name's Miles, and I graduated from the apprenticeship about two months ago, two months ago, thereabouts. And I'm working for uh, the client that was in Gaslight about 30 feet through the floor that way um, on a project called Monarch, which is a construction accounting package. I'm Anna, and I'm an apprentice at Kroger, and I'm also halfway through the program. And we are work I'm working on the item validation tool, and it's basically um, an internal app for taxonomists at Kroger. And we also recently started working on another project, the ClickList web project, which is also you go online and you order your groceries online. So um, working a full stack, back end and front end right now. My name is Omar. I wasn't prepared for this. I found out <laughs> about an hour ago when Sasha told me, because I missed the email, I guess. Um, I work with Anna, we're in the same group, um, at Kroger and the apprenticeship. And yes, we work on the item validation tool, and it's pretty much 
um, kind of like the ad admin section where you go, where they go and they upload whatever products they want to sell on Kroger.com, and it's full stack. Um, I have been doing a lot of React work, and now I'm moving into Java, which is a little more scary, but we're getting there. <laughs> Okay, uh, so that's a really good question. So for me, um, I had been basically studying uh, different programming languages and building apps on my own for a couple of years before I found Gaslight in the apprenticeship program. Uh, and for me, what I found most helpful, I found some, there was some really nice uh, online tutorials. Uh, I think the one that really got me hooked into programming and web development was uh, a tutorial called the Rails Tutorial uh, by M Michael Hartle. So it's a uh, Ruby, Ruby on Rails, a really nice framework, easy to work with, easy to learn. Um, and it basically takes you through building it like a, a Twitter clone uh, on your own. And you actually deploy it, and you could go visit it on the internet, you could send it to friends. That's really cool. And from there, I just kind of made my own apps following that same kind of model and getting into different programming languages and things like that. Uh, so that was what was really helpful for me. Sorry, what was the question, Chris? Okay, um, I s my main thing that I used was Udemy.com um, and like other online resources, um, Udacity. Um, but I also used Free Code Camp, and I really focused on making projects and um, just sort of building out my portfolio, uh, learning JavaScript, and then. Uh, Chris told me to pick up React, so I kind of rebuilt one of my projects using React, and I was able to like learn a lot doing that, and then um, unit testing as well. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Okay. Yes. Oh, the other thing is like I went to a lot of the meetups, and I think that was really critical because. I was teaching myself, I didn't have a support system, and the meetups kind of gave that to me. Like there's a software development meetup probably almost every day of the week, four days a week at least. So, yeah. All right, I have a degree in mathematics, and so I had C++ knowledge about how to print um, tax reports type of thing from a CS142 class, like a very basic, that was my experience. Um, and I had met Chris and I was like, maybe this is a place I want to go with my mathematics, right, um, down the software development path. Uh, I went to a couple of meetups um, simply because I knew Chris and they did Rebound Rails here at the time. I was like, well, why not? So I started learning that. Um, and my brother was starting up a business at the time. And I was like, what a great opportunity. I will just learn how to make you a website. And so I just took as many Ruby on Rails tutorials online as I could. Um, t I, he does not have a website that I made, but I learned a lot along the way. Um, and that was probably the most helpful thing that I tried to do. Um, so I sort of, I, I had a bit of a fitful start to programming. I took a programming class in college, which was, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I know what a for loop is. I know what data types are. I know what recursion is, which is actually way more knowledge than I needed. I've so far, just last week, implemented one recursive thing in the application I've been working on for a year. Um, recursion is when, well, yeah, we had this fight last week, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Dan's not here, so recursion's what I say it is. <laughs> um, and I did that my freshman year of college, and then I didn't think about programming really very much until I left after three years because I realized I didn't want to do physics. And um, I was like, oh, I'm going to do programming since I don't know what I'm doing now. And I sat in my basement. I did free code camp, which was super useful um, for having some broad structure for, you know, here's a project. Uh, back, back in my day, they didn't really give you a lot of lead up and structure into making those projects. They're just like, hey, here's this thing. Build it. Good luck. Um, you, you guys have it easy now. <laughs> And um, that was really useful. Treehouse was really useful when I wanted something more topical. Um, that was great. 
And actually, before I came here and I started the apprenticeship at uh, Gaslight, I was working very briefly for like a month or two for a company up in Chicago, uh, just building out an e-commerce website for an IoT company. So that was not very related to the work I did here, but it was just a slow ramp up to familiarity with what I did here. Um, so I kind of started out with, like Anna, I wanted to build a web app. Um, I wanted to do it by myself. So I started out with do-it-yourself websites like Weebly, um, Wix. I explored a bunch of those. And then um, I realized I wanted to build something more complicated with a user base, login system. And so I did a lot of research online. I went to meetups. I explored different languages, Python, JavaScript, um, until finally I, um, I came across Ruby on Rails. And uh, I went to a meetup where they built a blog in like half an hour or something. And I said, OK, this is what I want to learn. So I tried learning Ruby on Rails using Udemy and online tutorials, and um, eventually I decided to go to an online boot camp called uh, the Firehose Project, and um, that really helped me grow a lot and build projects. Um, that was mainly my focus. I wanted to build projects and wanted to s get the process down because a lot of projects are just pattern. You just got to know the pattern. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like I've spent years trying to get into programming because I took classes in college on programming. And then because that wasn't allowing me to build a web app, I dropped it. And then again, after getting my MBA, I jumped into programming again. And this time, I was a lot more committed. And like I said, I joined an online boot camp. And that really accelerated um, my, my progress. And I was able to build a web app that my brother and my father could use to book tennis lessons. and. Um, I think that's the app that I shared with Chris, and we paired program on, we paired program on that one, and it was like finally goal accomplished. I built my own web app, so um, I was really happy with that, and then I was able to do the apprenticeship program. Well, um, <coughs> I started messing around with websites in high school or actually in middle school, like my, in eighth grade. I had, me and a friend had a um, website where you could download music illegally. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it didn't require any anything related to software development, really. It was pretty much a kind of like a Word document, and it just had, um, if you save it as HTML, you can do, it's basically technically a website. And it had links, and if you right click on the link and hit save as, um, then you could actually download the file. So that's how it worked. Um, <coughs> yeah. <laughs> um, while I was doing that, I was messing around with Photoshop because it seemed a lot more fun than messing around with code or anything like that. Um, and when I graduated high school, I never even thought about doing websites professionally or anything like that. I thought it was kind of... I don't know, it didn't seem real at the time. Even Facebook wasn't that popular then, even though I'm young, but that's how quick things change, I guess. Um, so I, it never s seemed like a real thing to me, um, or like a real profession. So I went to, to college for business administration. While I was in college, I was working, and I was working full time, and it, it became really hard to work and support myself and pay rent and everything and go to college, so I quit college. And then, um, about four years later, three or four years later, um, I was just working entry-level jobs, and um, I was doing like I was still doing graphic design with Photoshop and stuff like that for for fun. And a friend of mine, his family opened up a restaurant, and they wanted me to do like their their logo and do all the graphic design work for them. And I did that for them, and. They really liked it, and a lot of people liked it. I went into the restaurant, and I started getting a lot of business for um, f um, as a graphic designer. Um, so I was making some money on the side doing that, but it wasn't really much. Most people only pay like $100, $200, $300 um, for a project for graphic design. So it wasn't anything that I could support myself with. So I started, I started thinking, well, I want to do this professionally um, and, and see where I can take this. Um, but 
I wanted to do something that was related to that. So that's what I kind of was when I was thinking, um, maybe I can get back into um, web development and stuff like that. Um, and I basically thought about it and didn't do anything for like a month. And then one day when I thought about it, I'm like, okay, I'm going to start today. And the only way I'm going to start if, is, is if I pay for something because then I'm going to feel like I need to learn because I already spent my money on it. So I went to Team Treehouse and I bought a membership there. Um, and I started doing the basic HTML, um, yeah, the basic HTML and CSS course that they have. And that was December last year, 2016. Um, and that's basically how I started. And then when I started learning JavaScript, I was learning the basics of it. Um, I started doing a project just for fun. It was a game um, just so that I could test what I was learning. And at the same time, I, was, I wanted to get more involved and whatnot, so I started coming to the meetups here. And that's when I met Chris. And then when Chris told me about the, um, the apprenticeship, I was like, I have something that I could show you, but I don't know if it's good enough. Uh, and I showed it to him, and he liked it. And then we worked on it together. And then he invited me to join the program. And it's been great since then. I um, get to work at Kroger and actually and I'm now I'm actually learning stuff and um, and finally bringing some value to them also, not just learning, but I'm actually producing now, um, working on React applications um, and stuff like that. Well, so I think the what were you most excited about coming to the apprenticeship? I think that's that's pretty easy. Uh, like, actually being able to ship something on a just a, a really large scale production app and, and seeing it work, like that was really exciting to me because I built like probably three or four apps on my own, but it was just the only user was me, right? So it's, it's a little bit different when there's like millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of users uh, that are using code that you wrote. Um, so what scared me the most? Uh, all the development work I did for two years was on my own, where I just sat in a room and just programmed. And I was coming onto a team with experienced developers that had you know, years of experience on me. S most of them have college science degrees. Um, and I just kind of taught myself. you know. Uh, so I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know if I was going to be able to keep up. Um, and I didn't know if I was going to be able to fit into like the, the team workflow. Um, so that kind of scared me coming into it. But um, since I've been there for three months, now, uh, I can say that none of those fears were really valid. Like, it, it actually went pretty smoothly. I was pretty excited about starting to get a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I was also really excited about just, because I was also coding on my own, just to how do you code with other people? You know, how do you code on a real application that produces value? Um, and to just be on a team and um, at a company like that. Um, I was most scared of, of also kind of being on a team with other developers. You know, I was self-taught, so I wasn't quite sure at what level they were expecting me to be. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to like gel with the team or like if I would just, just not understand anything at all. So um, yeah, I was pretty scared the first couple of weeks of my apprenticeship because it was really difficult, but then I started picking things up. And I, uh, like I said, have a degree in mathematics and one of the things I loved about studying mathematics and I still do and I'd go back in a heartbeat. Um, was that I felt like while I was sitting in class and I finally got something, is like I could almost feel my brain like grow in a way that I, I didn't, I couldn't understand something like that before, and now I can. Um, and so when it came to being excited about what I was what I was excited about was experiencing that again without mathematics, like experience, experiencing it again in a different field, and knowing like okay, I my brain does not work in a computer science way yet, like I just don't have the experience yet. And I knew that there was so much I didn't know that I was bound to grow in a way that I've never grown before. And I was excited about how that was gonna, how that was gonna pan out. So that was what I was most excited about. Um, I remember coming in <laughs> to pair program with Chris, and I was like, Chris, I just don't know why this doesn't compile. Like, there's just this red squiggly line. I just can't get it to go away. 
And he was like, well, it's because you're trying to write a ternary and you only have half of it written. And it was just like a, this moment of like, I have no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> um, and I remember I walked out of the interview with the client and I don't know if I, you know this or not, but I walked out into the parking lot and I just laughed. I was like, there's no way. There's no way I got that shot. Like, that was horrible. I know nothing. Um, and so I was just really scared because I was like, I, I'm walking into the dark and I might not survive. <laughs> well, um, there are specifics of my case. I, I moved down here from Chicago and I didn't really know anybody here outside of basically Chris. Um, <laughs> so that was a little bit scary. Um, but aside from that, I, I was moving, I actually, I'd been teaching myself for a while and I'd been working for about two or three months for that e-commerce site I mentioned before. And the great thing about that is uh, it was just me making the website and nobody could judge me because nobody had any <laughs> idea what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I came here and it's like, oh, I'm on a team with Chris who's been doing this for 20 years and now I like actually can't just like bake up whatever garbage I want and it compiles and it works. So <laughs> that was scary. Um, and, uh, uh, but I was really excited to have the opportunity, you know, when I was working at the e-commerce company, it was like I was hired there to get this website up, to get it to work. And that, uh, at that particular stage, having, you know, just come out of teaching myself, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a situation that was really conducive to me growing as a developer. And here it was explicitly, you get six months to learn as much as you possibly can. The goal of the everybody who's training you is to try to make you as competent as you possibly can be, not to try to get you to write a bunch of code really quickly right now. And that, um, I was really excited to get to have that opportunity and in retrospect, I should have been very excited about that. Um, so when I found out that I got the apprenticeship, I was super excited. Um, I knew that finally I'd be able to work with other developers and get to learn from them. And I was just really excited about being in an environment where I could eight hours a day. So I knew this would totally accelerate the progress of my skills. So that's what I was really excited about, um, just being around developers and programming for eight hours a day. Um, I guess what scared me the most was coming from a Ruby on Rails background, I found out that I was going to do Java and React. And so I was like, OK. so. I'm not gonna know anything for a while. <laughs> and um, yeah, I thought, like, I was scared that I'd be totally clueless and lost. But um, it actually, it didn't turn out that way because um, just from doing programming in other languages, in Ruby and Rails, that teaches you to follow patterns. And so even though I'm not great at React, I was able to turn an Angular app into a React app, just following patterns. and. Um, so that was my like, oh my God moment at Kroger when I was able to take a part of their Angular app and turn it into React. I was like, I don't even know React that well. This is incredible that I just followed patterns and was able to recreate it in React. So um, that was one of my biggest fears. But um, as a programmer, you learn how to deal with the unknown and you Google things. You look at the existing code base for patterns and you just um, my hope is that I become a developer that feels like I can handle any challenge. And like I feel like I will not be stumped by anything. I'm not there yet, but I know I'm gonna Me get neither. there sooner or later. So. All right, so it's things that, I'm ex that I was excited about and things that I was scared about. Yeah. All right, so the main thing that I was excited about, like Sasha said, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just um, not necessarily the big check, but just just any type of check, um, <laughs> <laughs> really. Um, when I was when I was um, teaching myself, like when I first started, and I first um, when I first started, um, I was working, and I realized that it was gonna be really hard for me to work full time. Not that it's not doable. Maybe I'm just a little bit lazy. I don't know. <coughs> But it was really hard for me to work full time, especially at the place that I was working. I was working like over 50 hours a week. And then um, on the weekends, just work on, on, on web development. I, I didn't feel like I was making much progress every time that I touched it. I feel like I forgot everything that I learned the week before. Um, so I found, a, um, I found something that I could do on the weekends part time. And I was just, and I quit my day job. And I was focusing on web development from Monday to Friday. And I think that's why I was able to make a lot of progress um, 
from December um, until um, I got into the apprentices. That was um, May. Um, it was May, right? That we talk about it. Because I started I think June, June, but yeah, I think yeah, you started. It was in June. like five or six months. Um, but yeah, I had to quit my job, so I, I I didn't have any much income coming in except for what I was doing part time on the weekends. Um, so I was living worse than paycheck to paycheck, and just the opportunity that I was going to get paid to learn, and I was a, I was going to be able to actually um, work on it eight hours a day rather than just a couple hours on the weekend. That was that that made all the difference. And um, when he told me about that, I I moved here. I'm actually not from Cincinnati. I um, I'm from Dayton. So um, I started looking for apartments, and basically I live here now in Cincinnati, and that's all I do full time. So that was the thing that I, that I was the most excited about, and, and I still think it's the best opportunity and one of the best things that could have happened to me. Um, so um, things that I was scared about, um, pretty related to that, I was scared that I was going to come in and that um, it was a big corporation, so everybody else is probably going to have a big computer science degree or whatnot, and they were going to be like, oh, this guy is not real. Uh, we're going to let him go, and then I was going to be stranded here in Cincinnati with rent and bills to pay with no job. <laughs> um, so that was the biggest thing that I was um, scared about the most. And then um, what I'm excited about the most now is um, it's kind of like what Anna's saying. It's just getting to that level, getting to that level that um, experienced developers are at. Um, there's a guy um, at Kroger um, that I work with, um, and I works, we work in the same team. Um, his name is Steve. He doesn't know any, um, any JavaScript. He, he's been working there at Kroger, and he's been working on, on backend stuff for over 10 years, and he doesn't know any JavaScript. And um, one day I, I paired with him, and he decided to choose a JavaScript story because he didn't know any JavaScript. And I'm thinking, what? But um, he just wanted to take the challenge on it. And um, without knowing JavaScript, he, um, he basically picked up the story. And he used the knowledge that he knew from other, um, so, um, from other languages. And he used Google a lot. And by using Google and the knowledge that he had, he was able to complete the story like he knew everything about JavaScript. And me, that actually knew JavaScript, or at least I thought I did. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to solve um, that, complica that complicated of, a, of an issue as he did. So I, I, I think it's just super exciting to see people that, um, that, are so, um, that have so much experience that they can pretty much solve any issue, even if they don't have, e even if they have minimal tools, but the tools that they do have, they can um, maximize them and um, get things done anyways. So I, I think that's the most exciting thing. That's awesome. All right. Do I have another question? Oh, yeah. How did it? How did the experience of apprenticeship compare to what you expected, or how was it different? Oh, okay. Um, so, for me, I think it, it, it kind of met my expectations, but it went a little bit uh, beyond my expectations in terms of like the breadth of what I was learning. So I thought I was just going to come in and just learn web development, right? You're just doing, like, okay, I'll do server side stuff, I'll do front end stuff, maybe, right? But it's not just that, right? You learn about uh, at least in my case, so I've been learning about like how do, how do you actually deploy these things? Like how do you get them in front of people? And um, there's other things too, like uh, scripting, shell scripting to automate tasks and things like that. Like just things I, I didn't even imagine I was gonna learn about when I started, I now actually feel pretty comfortable with and I'm three months into it. So um, but yeah, aside from that, I think it's kind of exceeded my expectations in terms of what I learned. I was very surprised by like the breadth of the work that I've got to do. I thought I'd just be like doing JavaScript and then I just push up my code changes. But then I had to, like Zach said, uh, scripting and then just debugging production issues or like issues um, on the website, uh, bug reports. So yeah, just like learned a lot of stuff that I didn't expect to learn. Also, also like skills like just how do you communicate with your pair for eight hours a day, you know, especially when it's like three o'clock and uh, it's uh, Friday and you know, you gotta, you just wanna leave, but you know, you gotta go over the code to make sure it looks good before committing it. 
um, and just so much reading code, you know, I thought I'd just be out there um, just typing stuff out, but most of it is just reading and looking through the files and like trying to make your change in a way that it's composable and it's reusable and that, you know, it does justice to what the other programmers have done. Um, so you're like not doing any harm to the code base. Um, and mm, I'm also surprised I didn't expect how much fun it would be. Um, even the really difficult days were fun because, you know, you ended up learning so much. And I really thought that I was the one who didn't know anything and everyone else knew everything. Um, so I was a little surprised by the amount of Googling my team did. Um, I was not the only one who needed to go to Google to figure something out. Um, mostly I was expecting it to be interesting and other than that I didn't know what to do. I mean I told you that I laughed when I left the interview so it's interesting. Um, and in that way it's exceeded my expectations for sure. Um, I'm not bored. And um, Oh, I know what I was going to say. So we, we, on my team, we still pair program every day. So from day one to uh, here, like a year and a half later, we still pair program every day. And I expected when I started that we would pair program, and I expected it would be with Chris and the other apprentice, and that we would start off really slow, and we would make, we would learn a lot, and then we would maybe do some things that were valuable, and then by the time I was halfway done, we would like really be finishing stories, you know? And then by the time I was over, I would, I would be still be the lowest one on the totem pole. Um, but that's not what happened. My team um, took us in very much like they were, we were their own, and we, I paired with everyone on the team. Um, we switched about we switched pairs once a week or tw twice a week. So you had two different pairs every week, and I, I rotated around with everybody. Um, and by the end, when I was hired, they treated me like I was just one of them. Um, I was definitely not the oh you're the just you're the new graduate. You know we're still a little iffy on you. Um, it was not like that. It was very much. I am one of you, I complete stories on my own, just like you do when sometimes someone's out. Like, it was just very, very smooth transition, and I wasn't expecting that. So when I came in, um, most, most of the learning I'd done recently uh, was in JavaScript and Node, and it was all web apps, and Chris mentioned Rails a few times, so I sort of like bullshitted my way through <laughs> the Michael Huddle <laughs> tutorial that he mentioned earlier. <laughs> and I came in, and I'm like, sure, I know Ruby. And that's all, that was a lie. Um, <laughs> and still, first day, first day, I've, I've deliberately not gone back and looked at this commit, but the first day they had me committing something in the Ruby code base in the back end. So uh, when I was a few months in, I felt really pretty comfortable with everything that was happening. And the benefit of not really knowing it or teaching myself a lot about Rails uh, before I started here was actually I knew a lot more about JavaScript than I thought I said I thought I did. And I actually still sort of own a lot of the JavaScript that works in our application right now. And I sort of, I, I owned a lot of those components throughout the apprenticeship. So that was pretty awesome. Um, and uh, uh, wait, I have one more thing to say. Uh, notes. Do, 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 do. Um, so the, the technical stuff I wasn't really too terrified by. Um, the interesting thing was I didn't work with, like, I think all of you guys work at Kroger, which is a different context than the sort of apprenticeship I did. The apprenticeship I did was I work for a company called Computeries, and the project I'm working on right now was started here at Gaslight and is currently made up of me and one other person who work for Computeries right now. It was almost all Gaslight people there. Um, and uh, the way that Gaslight handles clients that are actually working with Gaslight teams predominantly and not with apprenticeships is, you, you know, you have your designers who you're working with and the project leads who you're working with every day and you have stand-ups every day for 15, 30 minutes. And the conversations you have are really free-ranging. I wasn't pinched and hold into only discussing, you know, technical things and learning, oh, you know, these are the intricacies of our Git flow. And there was a lot of discussions about UX and about design and about, you know, bits of the code that I didn't actually end up touching that I learned a lot about. Um, that was really rewarding and interesting. Um, so for me, um, I think that the apprenticeship has definitely exceeded my expectations. Um, I mean, I expected to not know a lot coming from a Ruby and Rails background. 
but um, everyone has been like super helpful. Like I was surprised by how I didn't run into anyone who gave me attitude or anything or who was mean. Like everyone's really nice. Everyone answers all my questions. And also, um, like Anna said, I was also surprised that, um, to meet people like Steve who weren't familiar with everything. Like it wasn't like I'm working with a bunch of know-it-alls who know everything. Like there are times when they have no clue and they, they actually, um, they say that to me, like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm going to Google, or I'm going to look at the code base and see if I can find any examples of this. And that's really surprising to me because I thought that I'd be the only one who'd be clueless for a couple of the tickets. But um, um, it's a new team, so they did inherit the code base, and there's a lot that they don't know. So it's kind of it's kind of cool to be on, to be able to relate to them in that way. Um, they don't know everything. And it's, like Omar said, it's cool to pair with Steve because he will, he's an experienced programmer and he knows how to solve problems that he's never encountered before. Even though he might be clueless on how to solve it, he gets the job done and that's really cool to see the process from start to finish, how he can do that. Especially for me, someone who, who's coming in and doesn't know everything, those are the skills that I want to see. Those, that's how I want to um, approach problems myself. So those are really, important skills to know. Um, I guess it was surprising to just, um, yeah, it was surprising to pair program with, with people who um, are not 100% like knowledgeable about what they're doing and just seeing how they approach a problem. Um, and I'm also surprised by how much I've done for the group and how much I've learned as well. One of the things that I was surprised about um, was how different everything is to what I expected um, working for a big corporation like Kroger. And by the way, we don't all work for Kroger. Um, I don't think he does over there at the corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I, I just had no idea how everything worked. Everything that I worked on be before I started the, the apprenticeship was, I did it on my own. and. Um, for example, I try to learn GitHub because everything online said that I should know GitHub, um, but it's not really useful for one person. So <laughs> it was pretty easy when I was trying to learn it for myself because all I was doing was submitting everything to master and then getting getting everything from master and modifying it. <laughs> but I was using GitHub, <laughs> um, so obviously, like a lot of things like that, when you actually work in a company where there's hundreds of people working on the, on the same things, um, or at least in your team, there's at least 15 people, um, or around 15 people, e everything changes. Um, and there were a lot of problems, for example, when I first started, um, um, that I was in the same group that Sasha is, that I was thinking, oh, you can easily do that with this library. Yes, but we cannot just put the library in there. There's a lot of corporate red tape around that. <laughs> and the whole team needs to agree. And there's, a, there's just a lot more things that I could have never learned on my own that, um, that I learned working, um, working there. Um, so that was probably the, the most um, surprising thing. Um, um, another thing that was surprising um, is how accurate Chris seems to be about everything that he says, which is kind of weird. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when I first started, I was so lost, and um, like I said, everything was so much different than what I than what I have done on my own at home. That I thought like this is gonna take me forever for me to learn everything. Um, and then um, I used to look at Sam and Sasha um, at that time. Um, when when I first started, they were um, about three or four months in. And I used to look at them like, wow, they're, they're genius. They actually learn all this stuff in three months or whatever. Um, I, I could never, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to, to do anything and help them um, when I have three months here. And Chris and Josh used to tell me, don't worry, when you get to that point, you will be able to actually contribute and, and solve problems on your own and, and work on your own. And that's exactly the way it worked out to be. You know, I can pretty much do anything that's React related at work. Um, 
even things that I that look like too scary for me to pick up and say that I'm gonna do. Um, for example, me and Anna had a story that we were looking for some, we were pairing together and because we were both apprentices, we were looking for something easy to do um, so we could get it done and not look bad. But there was nothing easy. <laughs> so we picked up something that we thought we, we were not gonna get done, um, but we just picked it up because it was like what we thought was the easiest thing, even though it was pretty hard. Um, but we were able to get it done um, b pretty much by ourselves um, without much help from anybody else. And um, that's happening a lot of times when I pair with her and when I, when, um, when I have work by myself. Um, I paired with my mentor actually last week and I did probably 100% of the work since we started pairing. And I just, when I first started, I thought I would never be at that level um, within three months and they are right and I was wrong or what I was thinking was wrong. So he was pretty accurate about that. <laughs> Well, what I'd like to do now, um, that's most of the questions that I had. Uh, I really wanted to give you guys a chance to ask any questions um, to me, to all the apprentices. Um, I just want to give you a chance to, to ask questions that you might have. Yeah, please. That, we were actually recording, sorry. Oh, so. okay. Um, how did Chris and the team prepare you for your first day at the company that you were sent to? Like, what tools or how was that? I'll field that poorly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so I think in, in, our, in my particular situation, I had been talking to Chris for probably, I think it was like a little over a month before I actually started the apprenticeship. And there was, up to the, the start date, there was kind of, a, you know, Chris would be in contact with us talking about like, okay, you're gonna start this day. Uh, you're gonna be with these people. Um, we were able to meet the other, I, I met the other apprentice uh, that I paired with, or that's in my group, um, a couple weeks before we actually started. Uh, then the first week that we were actually at the company, we had, uh, it was like just an orientation uh, kind of thing. I don't know if they did that at, at Kroger or any of the other clients. Um, but yeah, we had like a week-long orientation to, to get to know kind of the systems that we we're going to be working on and, and things like that. Different experiences? Yeah, they pretty much just threw us in. Uh, came in on day one and started pair programming, which is really not a bad thing because just hit the ground running and you'll pick it up. I think we had a 15 minute meeting, uh, the three, two apprentices and Chris together. And then I showed up and there was a laptop and it was set it up. <laughs> um. So I actually worked on a team with Chris and several gas letters for my apprenticeship here. Um, so that was, you know, the, the explicitly I was working with Chris who was working to bring me up to speed. But just to be clear, I, there are men I don't know anything about this, but there are mentors who are working for Gaslight who go into the companies that you guys are working at who are yeah. specifically there to bring you guys up to speed is my understanding. Chris was there when I walked in the first day, so it's not like Chris. And then there's, yeah, there's, you, I don't know your name, but I think. <laughs> In the back. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Um, so I guess, like, I was, I was talking to Chris beforehand for maybe a month or two, and he kind of gave me an idea of what Kroger was like and the tools and development technologies that they use. And, um, he mentioned Java, so coming from Ruby and Rails, I jumped into Java, and it was totally different. Um, also, I also practiced some React tutorials, and then once I got started in, in the company, it was just like hit the ground running, basically. Uh, we just paired with someone and just worked on some Angular app, so. so and I hadn't had any experience with Angular, but um, yeah, at Kroger, there are a lot of technologies that they use that I just didn't know coming in. But it's okay, because like I said, um, in programming, it's impossible to know everything, and it's really cool to just um, watch others solve problems, and then you can eventually learn the same problem-solving techniques as them. It's not bad. All right, so your question was, how did he prepare us? What was the gaslight team used for your first day? For our first day? Um, well, pretty much, he was pretty accurate about that. Um, Everything that, he's, that he told me it was gonna be like was pretty much what it was. Um, and 
for the first day specifically, it was kind of more like we got an email with like where we needed to go to get our, our, our badge that would let us into the door and all stuff, like, all that type of stuff. Um, but Chris told us like what what he thought would be um, good for us to start learning about, and he. In, in our case, he, um, or in my case, he told me to start learning React um, because at the beginning I'm probably going to be working on a more front-endish group uh, that works with React and Angular, um, but that React was kind of more like the way they were going and, the, and Angular they were trying to get away from. Um, so he told me if I need to choose one, focus more on React. Um, and then he also told me that eventually I'd be moving to another group that, that does a lot of Java. So he also told me to, um, to to try to um, take some time to learn Java uh, when I could. So um, that's pr that was pretty much it. For the first day, there, there was nothing really too special about it. Um, we got there, and everybody in, in, in our group, that, that was like 12 or 15 people, um, they pretty much got in a circle. They told us their names, and then um, we went out to lunch. And we had lunch, and <coughs> and then when we came back, we paired with our mentor, um, and he was pretty much like trying to show us how, um, like things that we might want to work on also. But there was nothing. There was nothing special. There was nothing like, oh, if you don't do this when you first go there, they're not gonna like you or anything like that. Everybody's pretty cool, and there was nothing really special um, about it besides the fact that it was the first day. Yeah. Well, the first day was pretty much just like the second, the third one. Yeah. Audience questions. I know that guy. During the uh, apprenticeship, what's the workload for you guys outside of just hours as far as uh, facilitating learning the new frameworks and technologies that you guys are working with? Um, so, I think Chris kind of gave us some good guidance when, when we started with the apprenticeship. He, he basically told us if you need to take like an hour, maybe uh, later on in the day when you're not really pairing with somebody to, to go look at something, maybe read up on some documentation for some framework or some language that you don't really know or you're not really familiar with. If you're not feeling comfortable, as an, as an apprentice, it's acceptable to tell your team, hey, I need to go take a time out and read up on the specific thing that we're trying to do right now. Um, so honestly, right now in my third month, um, I do mostly, I would say 80% of my time is spent either in meetings or actually pairing and, and doing code. Um, no, more than that, it's probably like 90%. Um, so 10% of the time maybe we'll spend like looking at some technology I'm unfamiliar with or trying to learn a little bit more. Um, but I tend to do a lot of that just, you know, after work or on the weekends or whatever. But that's just my preference. Uh, outside of work, usually five to ten hours a week. Um, you're just going to be learning so much at work that, like, I wouldn't recommend that you just burn yourself out just programming all the time. Like, um, because you learn when you're not programming, too, when your brain is resting. It's learning. It's processing the information in the background. Um, but, yeah, when I'm at work, I'm usually trying to pair program as much as possible with my team um, because I feel like that's the fastest way for me to get ramped up. We, with book club, um, you have to read X number of pages by X time, um, and so that was, that's outside of work, usually, and um, another thing I did as an apprentice was I kept a running list of things that I don't know. Um, I, I don't know, for example, pa NPM packages that we're using, I'm like, well, what does that do? Um, words that my teammates would use that I didn't understand or know about, I would jot down, um, and more than a time commitment that I spent out outside of work, it was more of like, here's my list of things. And I need to keep this fairly short, because if it gets too long, I'm just going to get lost. So um, just whatever it took to keep that at a decent, it's never going to go away, but a decent chunk um, instead of letting it get too long. So whatever that means, 
meant for me at the time. That was what it was. Yeah, um, more or less what Anna said. Uh, there's the book club that happens every week. A lot of that is n not so much technical learning as you know, learning about what good code is, and that is always good to have in the back of your head. But I, it wasn't anything like I have five hours, 10 hours a week. I'm dedicated to learning technical subjects outside of work. It was, wow, I don't understand the specific thing that happened today, and I'm going to go in and program again with my pair about it tomorrow. I should probably know it tomorrow, because otherwise I'm going to continue to be useless. Um, so yeah, the book club, that's done outside of work, and then also I try to do tutorials on Java or React outside of work whenever I can, and also looking up specific topics that we covered um, during our pair programming session. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is done outside of work because um, during your work day you have meetings or you are just pair programming and um, working to deliver code. So I do most of my learning outside of work, either after work or on the weekends. All right, so I think that's actually one of the most important thing, um, like that question that you asked about how much time we put outside of work. And I think, at least in my case, um, there is some type of weird balance with that. Um, when I first started, um, I tried to go to work and I tried to be there and learn everything. Um, and um, for example, for example, when I was working with React, um, nothing was taken because I didn't know the basics. And um, people tried to explain the basics to me and stuff like that, but um, nothing was taken because um, they can only go so far back to try to explain something to you, um, but not everybody is going to have the time to spend um, three or four hours just explaining the basics to you. Um, so, for example, in that case, um, I had to go to go home and actually learn like the basics of React on my own. So I had to, um, I had the course that um, that Chris told me to do, and um, and I pretty much started taking that course or tutorial, and I, I learned the basics with that. Um, once, I, once I was able to grab the basics, um, and I was, then I was probably doing like three hours a day, every day after work um, for, like, for like a week or two. Um, because at the same time, I had to learn ES, ES7 or ES6, because everything that I knew about JavaScript was ES, ES5 still, because I took a lot of pride in knowing the basics and whatnot, um, and getting the basics right before I move over to something else. So um, I had to do all that learning um, outside of work to get up to the point that I could at least understand the basics so that I could understand what I was doing at work. But once I understood the basics, I didn't even have to finish my React course because um, I was at a level where they wouldn't, where anything my parent would say to me I would understand and everything that I see them do, um, I could understand it. Um, and then over time, um, I was able to, um, to pretty much pick it up. Um, because of that, because when I actually started working and actually started producing at work, I actually started getting tired at work. Uh, like, I, I would be tired by the time that I get off work. Um, most of my jobs before then, they were pretty manual. Now, I didn't use my, my head a lot, I guess, on my previous jobs. So when I used to be tired from work, I used to be physically tired. Um, after I actually started working and learning things at work and, and producing, um, I would be mentally tired. So it wasn't as easy to go back home and, and just put three or four hours um, like I used to do when I first started um, in, into learning on my own. Um, with that said, um, after, actually pretty recently, the past, the past week, um, they told me that I have made a lot of progress with, um, with React and that they feel that I can pretty much solve any issues that I have with React and now they want me to focus more on Java. On Java, I don't really know the basics because I actually never ever touched it before. So I'm getting to that point again where the whole time I work, I'm not understanding anything. So work is easy because I'm just kind of like looking at stuff and <laughs> trying to understand. Um, because I'm so lost, but um, because work is easy, I'm not mentally exhausted when I get home. So when I get home, I can actually do again like like I did last night. I did three hours of learning um, the basics of Java, and I was actually planning on doing that tonight until Sasha ruined it. But um, 
Um, but yeah, so I think there's a weird balance. But I also think is is very important. I don't. I think there are there are some things that um, you just have to learn on your own because the team they are trying to help you, but you don't also want to waste their whole day because of, in having them teach you the very basics. Um, so I think at least the basics you probably have to learn on your own, and then um, it's. It's still great because once you do learn those basics, you get to put it to use every day and every day and every day. Um, and I think that's why I got pretty good at React because what I learned, I was doing it every over and over and over. <laughs> Thanks. So you guys are all Gaslight apprentices, uh, and then you were injected into another organization with your team. Did it feel like you guys had two bosses, or did it just work seamlessly? That's a good question. Yeah, no, I, I, I never really felt like that at all. Um, so Chris is my mentor uh, at Plexus, so he's actually there with us um, pretty much every day. Uh, and then we have, there's a guy in the, our team that we call the tech lead, uh, who basically kind of coordinates the whole entire development team uh, for us. And then we have, you know, like the CTO and all those people, but. I mean, they're so far removed that they don't really feel like your boss. So I don't know. I, I just doesn't really feel like you have like a boss, like El Jefe looking down at you. <laughs> so yeah, I don't really feel like I have two bosses. Yeah, I have to agree with Zach. I feel like I don't have a boss, um, <laughs> which is kind of good in a way because there's no like pressure coming down on me. I can just like kind of take the time to learn and grow and just focus on writing good code, focus on contributing to the project, to being a good team player. Yeah. The culture at Kroger is that you have a half an hour time period with your manager every two weeks to chat about whatever it is that you need to chat about with your manager. Um, and so in that way, that is very much your manager because you have a relationship with them um, that you talk about stuff with. Um, in the same way, you have Chris who is having a one-on-one -on -one with you every week, or every two weeks, I think it was, in uh, book clubs and that kind of thing. So in the same way, you're spending time with them and you're developing a relationship with them. Um, in my case, my manager started like two, three weeks after I did. So he was just as brand new. So we kind of walked that path together. Um, but Chris and I'm assuming the other mentors are very good at being humble enough to know that they're your mentor and you work for them, but they're here as part of also working for the client. And so as a team, the three of you or your pairs of apprentices or however many there are and the mentor um, work together to be what is best for the client. So it's a teamwork. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, very much the tail end of what Anna said again, um, which is that at least where I'm, I'm not working at in a large team. Right now, it's actually me and one other guy working on the application that I'm working on. Um, but when I was working as an apprentice here, it was very much the, the whole team, including the uh, president of the company that I was working for, is coordinating certain tasks that need to have, that need to be done in, in that particular day. And that's all reached very cooperatively and everybody sort of worked out how we want that work to be prioritized. So. It, it, it feels sort of like I don't have a boss, per se. We sort of all figure out what the work that should be done is collaboratively. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty seamless. Um, I also feel like I don't really have a boss. Um, we, as a team, we work together to finish the tickets that are assigned by the product manager. And so as long as you get the tickets done on time, um, then, there are no problems, but um, yeah, um, I think they give us plenty of time to explore different options or um, research some topics if it's a particularly hard ticket or whatever. Um, yeah, I think I think the team is the boss. Like, <laughs> we don't really report to anyone except for um, I guess at the end of four weeks or whatever a sprint is, a Kroger they do um, day two weeks is when we get together and we look back at the two weeks and see how much we've accomplished. And so um, it's, right, exactly, because we do, we have stand-ups and so during stand-up you, you report 
to everyone what you're doing, what you're working on, if there are any blockers, if you need help on anything. So um, I don't feel like I have a boss, but at the same time, I am reporting to everyone and everyone does care about what I'm working on. So it's teamwork. Yeah, I don't think it was any anything. Um, um, I don't feel like I have two bosses. Um, I feel like I have like 15 um, <laughs> <laughs> or 12. I don't know how many people there is exactly. But but um, definitely um, Gaslight is wouldn't be one of them because I, I feel like when you think about like your boss, you think of like oh this is the person that I need to be scared of um, or this is the person that I um, that I can mess around, um, that I can mess around with because they can fire me. And that's not the case with, with gaslight people at all. Um, with gaslight people, if we mess up, they mess up. So they don't want us to mess up. And um, I don't need to like hide anything from them or hide any frustrations or anything because they're pretty much like, um, like I said, they're our mentors. So pretty much we go to them for help. Um, but they're not gonna be the ones that are gonna be like, oh, we're gonna fire you because we don't like you. Because if they do that, they just wasted that company's um, or the client's money. Um, so um, to them, it's kind of, you. I looked at Gaslight when I need help and stuff like that. Um, so they pretty much there to help me. Um, and then, um, like she was saying, it's kind of like the team is the boss. Um, because the way that it works out at Kroger, um, the team gets, um, the things that they need to do. And the person that tells us what we need to do is um, the Scrum Master. But that's not really our boss. The Scrum Master is actually not even a developer, so they don't even know if we're doing the right thing or if we're doing it wrong. All they do is basically tell us what we need to do. And then when we get it done, we tell them. So that's what we do when it gets done. Our actual manager is the person that um, Anna was talking about, that redhead, Anna. <laughs> um, and that person also, um, they don't, I guess in our case, they do sit close to us, but that's just, um, um, that's just a coincidence. Um, usually they don't even sit with the team or anything. So the only way that the manager knows if we're doing good or bad is because of the people that we work with. So after we work with somebody, um, then he asks that person how we did. So if that person that I was working with, that I was pairing with, uh, tells him that, I was not doing anything and that I was just on my phone and not paying attention, that's gonna make me look bad. So basically every time that I'm pairing with somebody, it's like that person is my, is my manager or is my boss because basically whatever they say about me, it's what um, the actual boss is actually gonna know about me. So that's how it works. Cool. Maybe, uh, okay, a couple more and then we'll probably cut it off. I saw your hand first. So, Chris, this is sort of a question directed at you and oh. maybe Miles. Um, so we look up here and we see a lot of success. Um, but we see, so what is it, Flexus, Kroger, 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 internal gaslight, Kroger, Kroger. Um, and I've been here a couple months and it, I just sort of assume you live at Kroger. Um, how do we, as a, for those of us interested in maybe particip or acquiring an apprentice, it's probably not the right word. Um, <laughs> how do we compete with a gorilla like that? Um, how are we gonna be sure that you're gonna be available to mentor them appropriately? How am I gonna be sure that I'm not going to be stuck mentoring an apprentice when my small business, we only have enough developers to barely get the job done as it is? Um, and Miles, if you would wanna weigh in on that, I, it's a little bit different because you were an internal gaslight client, but if you could weigh in on how mentored you felt compared to, you know, Kroger. Sure. Um, so I guess I can answer the first part of that, which is like, how do you compete with like a behemoth like Kroger? Like, I, I know I'm almost like, are there enough good apprentice candidates to go around? And, um, what I really find, which is both great and terrible at the same time in different ways, is there are so many good people trying to break into the field of software development. We just don't have enough 
still, with everything I'm trying to do, we don't have enough opportunities for them to land. That is the problem that we have. Like, everybody else will tell you that, oh, there aren't enough developers, are there aren't enough developers. Like, companies will say that, but there's, there's actually a mismatch on the other side that's it's just as glaring. Um, so, like, right now, for instance, there's always this pipeline to manage. Um, right now, the way it is right now, I, I, I am looking to start another team and another client. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it wouldn't be me, it would be another mentor doing it, but... So... So, there's another mentor right there. And uh, Josh is my third mentor. Um, so right now, just to, just to talk capacity, right now uh, we have three mentors. We started with one a year ago. Um, so that means we could potentially run three different teams at different organizations at the same time. Um, the way it works is we usually start a team uh, with a pair of apprentices and then potentially add a second pair so a single mentor could work with four apprentices at the same time. And that's pretty much where I see things as far as like a reasonable cap. I mean, I think your point is very valid that I do not want the mentor spread so thin that the apprentices feel like they're not getting the help and support that they need. Um, that obviously wouldn't be good. And uh, yeah, if you guys wanna have any thoughts on that, any of you or all of you, but he asked for you specifically, Miles, so guess what? You're so special. You are um, special. <laughs> You're all special. <laughs> So, well, I, d I don't know how generalizable my case is because I, I, I was working here with a Gaslight team of Chris and Doug and Tyler and Katie and other people randomly here and there. So I, if I had difficulties with anything, I, I didn't feel like I had a whole lot of stumbling blocks going through the apprenticeship, but my distinct impression was that if I had any particular stumbling blocks, at least in that environment, I people were there to accommodate, helping me get over them. And I, 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 I don't know the situation in other companies, but I imagine Chris is on top of offering much the same opportunity to other people. I, I actually also feel like it really works best when the whole team mentors, like, it's, it's like I'm the buck stops here guy, right? Like I wanna make sure that apprentices are getting what they need, if, it, if, if they're not, like I, I gotta fix that somehow but it doesn't mean I have to do all the like day-to-day -day mentoring and pairing, and it's really better if I don't. It's yeah. really, that's what I th actually, I feel like I learned that, Anna, with your team first, because you were on the first team, that like the whole team coming in and doing it was like better than me doing it all the time. But. I was gonna say, I, I was a part of the first set that Chris started at Kroger, and every time a set comes, Chris comes over and he's like, hey, this is one of the first apprentices, if you need anything, you know, she's right here. And I've seen Sasha and Sam in the hallway. I see them sometimes across the way. Um, and I've tried to offer my help in any, I'm like, hey, you know where Team Batman sits. Like, you can find me if you need me. Um, I know that this is hard. I know that you're gonna wanna cry sometimes. Like, come over, I'm here, I, I've been there. And they don't. Um, and I don't think that's because it's not as challenging. I think it's because they have teams around them. Um, so plus or minus a mentor, there's a team there. And I think that that team effort is, is just as, sometimes just as valuable as a mentor. I think, okay. <laughs> I think um, that I don't think that should be a problem and I'm looking from the inside out. Um, because, like Chris said, it's not like we work with the mentors every single day. Um, th that's not the way it is, and that's not the way that I think it probably should be. Um, sometimes it feels like we see the mentors a lot, but even then, it, I only see, I only actually have like a, a real long conversation with my mentor um, about once a week. Anything other than that is just because he happens to be in my team. So if I'm going to ask a question to somebody, it's like, oh, that person is actually getting paid for that. So let me ask them. But I could, I could probably ask somebody else, um, and and I actually do it a lot too. So um, I think that if there came a case where um, they had to do less mentors per per or per apprentice, um, I think they could manage that just fine because. 
um, a lot of the mentors um, work, it's kind of um, um, making up in speed um, for the team on what the um, developers are or the apprentices are dragging it down. Every time we pair with somebody, that person might um, develop a little bit slower because they they having to teach us and stuff like that. Um, and then the mentor kind of makes up for that. Um, but I don't think it's, it's anything that's like, um, that is even close to being an issue. Um, um, there was just for us four, at, um, me, Anna, Sam, and Sasha, um, for a long time, and, and it worked just fine. We were still having our book clubs um, regularly. We were having our one-on-ones. He was still there to help us in anything that we needed. So I don't see how that would be an issue. I feel like the team could probably be double the size, and um, and they could manage just fine. Maybe the only difference is that the mentor is probably not going to be able to. He's probably going to have to focus a little more on the apprentices since there's so many, rather than just doing work for the company like a regular employee. Thanks. So, uh, you, a couple of you mentioned some of the challenges that you face going to uh, writing commercial code. So, I'm curi uh, curious, like, what are the types of uh, challenges you might have faced uh, writing commercial code? Um, you mentioned uh, you can't just add any library you want. Um, I know when I have a problem, I can go on Stack Overflow and post my code. I imagine you probably can't just do that with anything that you're writing for from other companies. So I'm just curious to, to see, uh, hear uh, your guys' experience. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And uh, so in my particular case, we work on like this huge code base. It's just massive. And it's, it's just almost impossible to understand everything that's going on in there. Uh, luckily, we have tests that show if you change something when, and something breaks way over there, like you have breaking tests. So that's cool. Um, but one of the things I really struggled with when I first started working there is we have a lot of internal tools. Right? We have internal tools to run integration tests. And there's no, there's no document. Like you can't just go to Stack Overflow. Um, and so the way that it, it works for us is we're lucky enough to have the creator of, of that tool is still in the company. And if you don't know how to work something, uh, it can be frustrating at times, but just reach out to them. Be like, hey, I have this problem. I'm not getting this thing. We're breaking all the builds because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a valid concern. There's, there's things that you're not gonna be able to stack overflow, but luckily in the company and even on the team that you're working with, there's usually somebody that has that knowledge that you need there. Um, so it's just a matter of asking the right person. Um, at a large company like Kroger, um, the biggest challenge is like um, the communication really, because if you look at the code, um, yeah, it's huge, there's a ton of it, but it's not like complex. At the end of the day, we just, what, we've got products we're trying to sell to people online, we got a payment system. Um, it's um, talking to other teams, um, um, communicating with your scrum master, your product manager, with your other teammates, that's the biggest challenge, getting the right context to figure out how to do your work correctly and not, you know, duplicate work that another team has already done. It's like. Uh, so in preparation for this, I sent an email out to my team and I said, hey, look, he's going to ask me about what my advice to apprentices would be. And you guys live this from the other side. So why don't you tell me what you would want to tell the next apprentice before they started? And uh, one of the things that came back was know when to ask for help. Um, there is a very delicate balance between I'm going to Google search everything, I'm going to stack overflow, I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do, and I'm going to implement all my own. And sometimes you just can't do that. That's just Sometimes that's just very impractical. Um, and that's when you have to pull in your tech lead, you got to pull an experienced developer, you got to pull Chris in, um, whatever it is. And I think um, when I watch my tech lead's eyes glaze over because he can't figure it out, um, then that's sometimes when we ask another team. Uh, we ask someone who's worked on the code before, um, like he said, you ask the creator. You, um, the Steve that they're talking about, it's like, you know, Steve knows he made this. Like, he knows what this is. Um, and so let's ask him. And if his eyes glaze over, then it's time to rewrite it um, <laughs> and just start <laughs> over. Um, and so we sit, at, at least at Kroger, it's big enough that there are um, experienced devs that um, are not afraid of stupid questions. Um, I've never been ridicul ridiculed for saying, 
I am right a turn here and I can't get it to compile. Um, stuff like that. So you asking other people, getting people from people, help from people who know what they're doing. Um, like watching video, I don't know. I mean, you just, you reach out to people internally and when your company's big enough, that just works. Uh, I don't think your original question really applies to me terribly. I, when I want a library, I download it and I use it. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with Sasha. Like, one of the biggest challenges is communication. Um, sometimes you inherit a code base and you know nothing about it, so you have a meeting with the team who wrote it or who has spent the most time with that code base and they get you up, up to speed. So um, I think Kroger does a good job of that, of setting up meetings. Um, our Scrum Masters are good with communicating with each other and setting up the right meetings so that our um, programmers know what's going on with the code base. Um, I think another challenge for me was um, getting exposed to different technologies. At Kroger, we have a marketing team and they want us to implement different technologies to track different metrics. And you can't just go and stack overflow and find things like that because these are technologies that I had never heard of before until I started working at Kroger. And the best thing to do with that is just to go to the docs and or look at the existing code base for examples of that that someone has already implemented. And um, like Anna said, we have very experienced coders who have been with Kroger for a really long time, so you just visit them and you get them to answer your questions. So um, yeah, I think the biggest challenges for me was communication and then new set of technologies that I've never seen before. Well, pretty much about like pitching library and stuff like that. Um, if you're an apprentice, it's probably just not gonna happen um, at a big corporation like that. Um, if you work here at Gaslight or, s or somewhere that where it's that smaller, um, I'm pretty sure it's a lot easier than doing it for like the second biggest retailer in the U.S. So, um, but pretty much the way that that they do it, um, like the experienced developers, when they do want to pitch a library is that they just ask everybody in the group. Every morning we do the stand-up meetings that somebody mentioned earlier, um, where the whole group um, talks about what's going on. And if somebody feels like, like, oh, we need this library because we have this issue and this would solve it, um, that's pretty much where you start. You pretty much ask everybody else if they would be okay with it. And then there are some things that we just can use. Um, like, for example, there's, um, I'm not gonna say exactly what it is because I don't know if there's like things or reasons why I shouldn't say it, but there's this product that we really wanna use from a competitor and um, in the Kroger business side, we, they just won't let us use it even though a lot of developers wanna use it. Um, so some things you can just talk um, to your team and then um, I guess they'll figure it out and then they come back with an answer. Um, but this whole thing that you asked about like how a um, corporation works and um, like the workflow of everything. I think it's probably one of the most valuable things of the apprenticeship. Um, the way that I think about it is I made a lot of progress in six months. Um, like I went from zero to learning um, enough JavaScript to like develop um, an application on my own and stuff, like, even though it was simple. Um, and I feel like if, if I had like if like money wasn't an issue and I didn't have to worry about paying bills or anything like that and I got to do that for two more years, like at the same rate, I feel like, yes, I will learn a lot more languages. Like I, I would probably learn React and learn Angular and I could probably go back and even learn Java with that much free time for over two years. But I still wouldn't know um, how to work at a big corporation. Um, I, I still just, I would have no idea. Everything that I, that I would have done would be, um, on my own and if I wanted to go work at a big corporation it would have made no difference whether I was coding by myself for two years or I was coding by myself for a year because I would still be lost and I still would it would take me a while just to learn how to be um, learn the steps and learn how to be productive for that company and I think that's why there's a lot of gap between developers that want a job 
the one jobs and companies that can't hire them because they don't have enough experience. Because just knowing the languages and knowing the technology is just, is just not enough. You need to know how to work um, in a big team like that. All right. So I'm going to close with this one because Anna reminded me I should, but we can skip you because you already answered it. Oh, I have a sheet of oh. of course you do. Anna is super prepared as always. Um, so last question: What is one piece of advice you would give to somebody who is trying to become an apprentice? Uh, one piece of advice, just one. Uh, I don't know. Many, many, any? Okay. Uh, five. So, no, I'm five. just kidding. <laughs> um, well, I guess one piece of advice I would give to somebody looking to become an apprentice, I think actually uh, trying to build something on your own that's, that's useful, that you can put out in front of people, that you can show and kind of be proud of, I think that's a huge step. Because you'll, you'll find there's a lot of challenges that you'll come across along the way. Uh, you'll figure them out, and it kind of, you know, it'll, it'll prove your, your problem-solving skills and make you, I think, ready for some of the challenges that you'll face when you're actually working for a company and, and programming on bigger projects. Um, have a routine for your learning. Um, I think this is hugely important because trying to teach yourself programming is difficult and it can be extremely frustrating at times. And if you don't have a set routine of when you program, you know, what could happen, and I hear this a lot, you know, someone was teaching themselves how to program and then they got frustrated and then they didn't code for like two weeks and then they got back into it, and then it's so much harder. So if you can just develop the habit of um, programming every single day, then it's not that difficult because um, the difficult part is um, starting a new habit. But once you have it started, you have the ball rolling, then you can just make progress. So my, my advice would be focus on the communication. So yes, coding is important. I'm not trying to dish your uh, advice, but my advice is a little different, and that is communication. You're gonna be working with a team. Um, teams are made of people, and so and so may make you really mad, but you have to sit at the same computer with them and type code and make things with them every day. Um, and so communicating with them, communicating what you don't know, communicating what you do know, um, learning to speak and be able to read code in English, um, being able to say. This is not working for me. We need to change this up. Um, all of that, that's so, so important. Because if you can't survive in the team, you're not going to make it. Um, and that's, that's my perspective. I don't know if you all feel the same way. But anyway. Um, and so like I said, I reached out. I'm going to read these. They're bullet points. I'm going to read them real quick um, so we don't take all your time. But um, for my team and my managers, they said the advice for a new apprentice would be be humble, be open to feedback, know you don't know everything, ask for help quickly, work hard, Relationships with your team are key, and pair with someone who's trying to build you up. Um, the willingness to learn and the capability to learn are qu quickly are important. Asking for help um, plays into this. If you're stuck, find the answer if you can. If not, ask for, ask for help. And find a project that you're highly interested in and work out a solution on your own at home. Um, well, they already covered a whole bunch of things I was going to say. So one thing I'm going to say is just if you're offered the opportunity, do it. Before I came here, I had a job offer and for a bunch of money and I would have been perfectly comfortable staying at home in Chicago with friends and family from college, or family and friends from college and what have you. Um, and I'm super glad I didn't do that because I definitely learned a lot more here in the six months and I'm in a much better place than I would have been had I taken that opportunity then. Um, I think for me, the number one thing it, that I would say is to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and s stay positive, have a positive mindset because like Sasha said, coding is difficult and every day like I encounter something that I don't know, every single day. So you need to be able to be positive and stay positive and know that even in 10 years, you still won't know everything in programming, and that's okay. That's fine. Um, like, you get into programming because you like challenges and you like solving problems, and maybe one day you want to build Facebook, um, the next Facebook. So, I mean, you just have to um, stay positive 
and I have to remind myself that like every day, like stay positive. This is an amazing opportunity you have to program with more experienced developers and it's just, um, yeah, so it can be frustrating, but you have to stay positive and I myself am learning how to be more comfortable with just being uncomfortable and not knowing everything because I feel like before I was always a perfectionist and I like, I felt like I knew everything and now I'm like, I don't know anything <laughs> and it's like that on a daily basis. So just be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Well, I think the best advice to get into the program, to get into the apprenticeship program, is to um, to build something. Um, I think one of you guys said it. Um, just build some type of application, and if you get done with one, then build it again with another language or build something different. But just build something, um, because if you want to get in, the, the main thing that he cares about is that you actually know and you have the right thought process. Um, for example, in my application, I wasn't, any, I wasn't using anything fancy. I was just using vanilla JavaScript. Um, but because it worked, and it worked perfectly fine, and it did everything that I expected, and it n never broke, no matter what you did to it, um, he still liked that a lot. And, um, and obviously, he offered me the, um, the opportunity to join the apprenticeship program. So building something, um, I think, is the most important thing. Um, and then once, if you, if you do start the apprenticeship, um, I think, like um, Anna said, probably communication is one of the biggest things. Um, in my case, I had, a, I had a little issue when I first started, and it was that um, at Kroger, they are full stack developers. So one day you might be working on the back end, the next day you might be working on React. The next day you might be fixing something in CSS, the day after you might be doing something with the database. At least that's how it is in our group. And I was doing that at the beginning and I could get nothing to stick because whatever I was doing Monday, um, on Wednesday I was doing something completely different. Um, and I, I did that for, for, about, for about a month. Um, and I learned some things but um, it wa I wasn't um, learning as fast as I wish I could. And um, basically, um, one day I talked to the team and I was scared to kind of like request how I wanted to learn. Um, but I told them what I thought would work best for me. And I told them, um, I'm, I've been doing a lot of um, React research at home and I think that it would benefit me a lot if I worked on a lot of React stories um, rather than being switching around so much. And they were completely fine with it. Like, I wish I would have said it earlier. And as soon as I told them, I, they had me just working on React every day for over a month. And I think that was the most important thing um, in me becoming um, proficient in React. So just the fact that I talked to them and I, and I communicated to them um, what I needed for my development, um, I think was like the biggest factor. And if I didn't do that, I don't know. I, seriously doubt that I would be at the level that I'm at today if I never told them that I was, that the way that we were doing it initially was not working for me. All right, well, I think we'll wrap things up there, um, but I really appreciate everybody coming. For those that are interested in possibly being apprentices, step one is to just send me an email at apprenticeship at teamgaslight.com. Um, but I'll be around for a few more minutes to answer questions in person, but thanks a lot for coming and thanks so much to uh, the panelists for agreeing to answer questions and be here, so thank you guys. Thank you.